And I say to you that the God we serve, he is an awesome God. Isn't he? He is an awesome God this morning. We are concluding a three-part series. Pastor would have done the first two parts and um, he entitled it, The Message Versus The Mess Age. And this morning we want to conclude that as we look at a, a subtopic, fulfilling God's mandate in an era of change. I want to ask you to turn your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we want to look at verses 1 on to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 5. And while you are finding it, let me just say to you that those of you who would need the bus, both buses are organized for this evening's session. So Kwame is going to travel up that side and we want you to get by the road for 6 o'clock. The bus is going to leave at 6. Likewise, Mom, Maklish, he is also going to leave Cities at 6 p.m. We want everybody to be at the session this evening. All right, I think by now you would have found it. It says, and I'm going to read for you. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And as I said, I'm sharing with you on the sub-theme, fulfilling God's mandate in an era of change. And I am certain that when you look at that subtopic, you would agree with me that we are definitely in an era of change. The question here is, what is God's mandate? And a number of you might say to me, Sister King, it is preaching the gospel. Some of you might say, well, mass evangelism. Some of you might say, I believe it's personal witnessing. While there are others who would say, giving of your monies, giving of your time, and giving of everything that you have. And there are others who would say, reaching the loss at any cost. The truth is, the mandate of God takes into consideration all that we have there. Preaching the gospel, mass evangelism, personal witnessing, giving, reaching the loss at any cost. And you would notice that personal witnessing is highlighted for you. I'm saying to us, if we are going to fulfill God's mandate in an era of change, we must consider all of the above there. But of course, personal witnessing is extremely important. I say to us this morning, we are in an era of change. And because we are in an era of change, it is extremely important for you individually, for all of us individually, to get involved in personal witnessing. I say to you that 
Mass evangelism is good. But ever so often, as individuals, we hide behind mass evangelism. May I submit to us this morning, Paul said to Timothy, I charge you before God. It's a personal charge that was given to Timothy. He said to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant. In season and out of season. The question here is, when last have you told someone about Jesus? Those of us that are saved, and a number of us here, we have been saved 40 something years, 50 something years, 30 something years, 20 something years. May I ask us this morning, when last did you tell someone about Jesus? We spoke about the message in a mess age. And I'm certain you would agree with us that this is a mess age. This age that we are living in. It's a conflicting age. It's a mess up age. And do they need the word of the Lord? People need the Lord. We sing that song all the time. People need the Lord. How will they hear if we don't tell them? How will they hear if we don't witness to them? Brethren, this morning, I have no doubt that the mandate given by Paul to Timothy, it is as clear as crystal. The mandate is clear. When I first knew this little church here, and that's when we used to face up that way, people like Sister Callis and company would remember that. They had on the wall, right up there, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And the question is, what is the mandate? The mandate says, go ye into all the world. And do what? Preach the gospel. And so the mandate is to everyone, not just a selected few. The mandate is to everybody. What is the mandate? The mandate I'm saying to us this morning, it's as clear as crystal. Preach the word. May I submit to us this morning that the mandate that God has given, it is still relevant in this era of change. Hear what Paul said to Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 2. He said, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." And he went on into verse 3. He said to Timothy, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Are we living in a time now when people don't want to endure sound doctrine? If ever, it is now. You know, everybody wants a glorified gospel, an instant gospel, a gospel that does not tell you how to live, a gospel that would appeal to your emotion. Paul said, the time will come. Brethren, this morning, I have no doubt that the gospel or the mandate that is given to the church. That mandate is still the church's mandate. It has not changed. What have you been doing since you got saved? That's the question. What have you done? What have you been doing since you got saved? How many persons have you told that Jesus saves? Brethren, this morning, the mandate given to the church is still the church's mandate. Let us for a moment look at this era of change. And I want to say to us, this era of change, it demands from us two key attributes. 
And I also want to challenge the children among us. I want to challenge our boys and girls. Adults, I want to challenge you this morning that this era of change, it demands two key attributes. One, holiness and nothing less. We are in an era when people don't want to hear about holiness, holy living. It is not something in the sky. It's a mandate of God that we live holy. And you look in the Old Testament and you look at Leviticus chapters 19 and 20. It records the Lord's emphasis on holy living. Way back then. Way back then in Leviticus. Now the Hebrew word for holy is kadash, which means to be sanctified, to be consecrated, and to be dedicated, or to be set up, separated from the world and worldliness. So it's like what trouble you're looking for here. The world and worldliness. We are in an era where you can't tell Christians about worldliness anymore. It's a word that is kicked out of the Christian dictionary. But I say to us this morning that God expects of us to live holy lives. Not only did the Lord command the Israelites to be holy, but in those two chapters, brethren, he gave them specific examples of things they could do in their daily lives to obey this commandment. And as you look through Leviticus, and you go into chapter 11, verses 44 and 45, it is emphasized there again. And somebody might say, Sister King, that Old Testament. We don't live in an Old Testament time. Ah, really? Really? The whole Bible for the whole man. Let's go into the New Testament. And you look at 1 Peter. And I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 1 Peter chapter 1. And it says here, But as he which had called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I say to us, brethren, that God expects of us to be holy. Not just Peter emphasized that, but Paul in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 14, it says to us what? Follow peace with all men. And what? Holiness. Without which? No man shall see God. Hey! Let me say to us this morning, brethren. Holiness is not something you put on and you take out. No! It is part of the Christian life. It is part of our everyday living. Holiness, brethren, is the lifestyle of the Christian. It is not something far-fetched. Are we perfect? Certainly not. I know we're not. But God expects us to live holy lives. I'll tell you that. I am sick and tired of the practice of unholiness among Christians. Hey, the Bible says that if you are going to name the name of Christ, live holy. He expects us to. It is not something you put on or we put on when we come to church. No. It is part of our daily lives. He expects us to live holy. Brethren, this morning, holiness should be our motto and our anthem in this era of change. I'm aware we're in an era of change, you know. I am aware that a number of things are happening now in an era of change. 
But I submit to us this morning. I submit to us, church, that holiness ought to be our motto and our anthem. When you sing the anthem of your country, you stand at attention. Huh? Those of you in working institutions, your motto, you live by the motto. You do the business of your institution. You uphold the motto. And so does God expect of us to live holy lives? Certainly. He does. You and I must purpose in our hearts. We must determine that we want to please God. We must determine that we are going to live holy lives. Not just the era of change demand from us holiness. It demands another attribute. But I say to us, if we're going to fulfill God's mandates in this era of change, we must put on that garment of holiness. And it's not a garment that you wash and you put on. It has to be your lifestyle, as I said. God wants us to live holy. God also wants from us that we be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I want to zero in on that today. When I got saved, and I'll tell you that, because this is a Pentecostal church. Huh? We have persons here who are not Pentecostals, but they are Christians, and we all are brethren, and we all believe in that Bible. We all believe in that. But when I got saved as a, as a teenager, I'll tell you something that I met in Christendom was that there was a hunger and there was a thirst for righteousness. There was a hunger and there was a thirst for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I do not hear much persons now talking about the Holy Ghost. Those of you who grew up in church, and I'm certain that people like Sister John and them could identify with that because they're born in church and they grow in church and they're still in church. So I'm certain they could identify that. That as a child, it was important for people to be filled when you became a Christian, to be filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 1, the promise is given there. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. I say to us this morning, the apostles, this was the era. And because it was the era, they understood the importance of being filled with the Holy Ghost. It was the apostles' era of change. They were called upon to be filled with the Holy Ghost. In an effort to fulfill God's mandate in the era of change. Hey, the apostles, they were going through a trying time. And listen to me. As you look at Acts chapter 1 or chapters 1 and 2, you would understand the importance of the Holy Ghost in the lives of the apostles. Look at Peter. After they were filled. Huh? You know what happened? People laugh at them when they were filled. They began speaking with new tongues. People laugh at them. And there were those who said, don't bother with them, they're drunk. And you know what? Peter being filled, the Bible says, with the Holy Ghost, stood up in the midst of them and he spoke. And he said, hey, we are not drunken as you suppose. What is taking place here is that which was promised. Joel foretold that. In the last days, God said that, I will pour out of my spirit. Huh? And if Peter and the rest of the apostles, way, way, way then, how much more? This is the last of the last days. Hey, brethren, look around. Tell me, what has to be fulfilled again? This is the last of the last days. 
And I'm saying to us as Christians and as a church, if we are going to fulfill God's mandate, we need the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. It was a phenomenon then. They have never heard people speak in tongues. Men speaking in unknown tongues. That was a phenomenon. People were wondering and um, it's like, where they came from? Who are these people? What happened to them? They knew them. As a matter of fact, they were ordinary fishermen, most of them. But you know what? The disciples or the apostles, they obeyed. They were told to wait. They were told to wait. And I'm saying to you this morning, note that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it gave boldness to the apostles. They were later way down in Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas. You know what they were referred to? They were referred to, these are the men who turned the world upside down. You know why? Because they relied on the Holy Ghost to empower them. Can I ask us that question this morning? Do you feel intimidated and timid and weak? Do you feel afraid to witness? Are you shy? Come on, somebody. I am saying to you this morning that you need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are Pentecostals, aren't we? And we subscribe to power statement of faith, number nine. We believe in the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. And you look throughout Acts chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 4, verses 31 and 33, and you see what was happening there. May I say to us this morning, the infilling of the Holy Ghost is not just a head knowledge. We are to be totally dependent on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and his anointing. Can I ask you, since you got saved, have you received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Is it important to you? Do you need God's Holy Spirit? Do you need his Holy Spirit? At one time, that was a focus in Pawi. But it's yes, you do not, you have not heard that clarion call for Christians to seek the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Many Christians are weak. They are weak. Many Christians live defeated lives because they do not know what it is to depend on the Holy Spirit. Hey, boys and girls, parents, I want to challenge you this morning that you allow your children to seek the face of God. Allow your children. You cry out for your children that God is going to baptize them. Does God use children? Of course. Of course he does. Think of David, shepherd boy. Think of Josiah. And the list can go on and on and on and on and on and on. Does God use children? Teenagers among us this morning, I want to appeal to you. I want to appeal to you. When I got saved as a teenager, that's what I meant. And as a young person, we were encouraged to seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We craved after it. We craved after it. We prayed and fasted because we understood the importance of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Do you feel feeble this morning as a Christian? I want to challenge you. Stop settling for crumbs. Hey, there is more for you. Stop settling to just be a Christian. There is one, say, one song that says, I don't want to be an ordinary Christian. There is a lot for us. Brother Bandy, there is a lot for us in this whole thing. Hey, it is for us. It was foretold in Joel's time. 
in the last days. Are we really in the last days? We're not just in the last days, you know. We're in the last of the last days. Look around you. Look around you. See what is going on. We need to live holy lives. We need to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost since you got saved? According to Acts chapter 19 and verse 2, a group of Gentiles who got saved. And when Paul encountered them, that was his question to them. Have you received? You know something? Today, we don't play the person of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, we talk about God the Father. We talk about Jesus the Son. And we kind of put the Holy Spirit, as a matter of fact, sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit as a thing. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. He's a person. He's a person. Jesus said that to his disciples. I am going, but I'm going to send you the comforter. Have you received him? Do you see the need to be filled by the Holy Spirit? I challenge us this morning. The Holy Spirit, he gives us boldness. Look at the whole account in Acts chapter 2. You see the apostles, they rose up in boldness. Huh? They rose up in boldness. I'll tell you that. We still, Brother John, we still have people in Pentecostalism who are not just afraid, but they are ashamed of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, teenagers, boys and girls, the Holy Spirit is for you too. Holy living is for you also. When you read, and I, I, I encourage you this morning, when you go home to read chapter 2 in Acts, and you would see the boldness there. The infilling of the Holy Ghost, he's committed to guiding us, according to Acts, to John 16 and verse 13. How be it, when he's come, he's going to guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live a life of faith in Christ, according to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. So I say to us this morning, the Holy Spirit is not a far-fetched topic. No, he is a person that wants to empower us. He is very relevant in the life of the believer in this era of change. Hey. I submit to us this morning, this era of change is filled with endless distractions. Parents, I want to appeal to you this morning that this era of change is filled with endless distractions. So your children, they are easily distracted. How much time do your children spend with? God. Do your children have prayer lives? Do they? Brethren, this morning, we definitely need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let us quickly look at the era of change versus God's mandate. I submit to us this morning that change is in Inevitable. We cannot escape it. I submit to us this morning that the mandate is a command from God to man. The mandate is a command. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a command. I submit to us this morning. We are in an era of change and this change is heralding the coming of Christ. I'll repeat that. Look around. Look around, brethren. 
saints of God, look around, open your eyes. There are many, many things to hold our attention. But I am submitting to you this morning that the era of change that we are in presently, you know what is happening? It's heralding the coming of Christ. The Bible says that he would come. The trumpet of God will song. Look around. You don't believe me? Go to Matthew chapter 24. And read Matthew chapter 24. Where the Bible tells us about all of those things that are going to happen. And you say, Sister King, well, it's a long time we've been hearing about wars and rumors of wars and what have you. It's a long time we've been hearing about pestilences. Don't you find that they are intensifying now? For the whole of 2022, I look at the pestilences that came upon various countries. Listen, there is an increase. There is an increase in pestilences. There is an increase. Yes, it was foretold a long time ago, but it's intensifying. There is a time bomb in Europe. A time bomb. Don't watch Russia, Ukraine war, just like that, you know. And don't say, well, it's too far from us. They're not my business. Uh-uh. No. And sometimes I sit and wonder, what has gone up in Putin's head? Why? I mean, I, I read all of the, the, the background info, you know, the, 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 the lies that the NATO countries would have done and Putin is mad. But come on. Wars and rumors of wars. Earthquakes in diverse places. This is an earthquake always taking place. That's true. That's true. It's intensifying. Mm -hmm. Have you paid attention to the floods we had in 2022? Endless floods throughout the universe. Where are we presently? We are basically in an era of change. Change is happening. I say to people that there were a lot of blessings that came from COVID and people get vexed with me when I say that. But it's true. COVID has opened our eyes to a lot of things. Not only that, COVID has exposed the church to see how naked we are. COVID has exposed the church. He has exposed our nakedness. Listen to me. There are some people who left church since COVID time. And they have not returned. And they tell you, well, I'm taking service. I always take service. Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. This is key. Brother, where is your sister? There are some people that I have called. Haven't seen them. And all I get are excuses. I say to us this morning that the change that we are going through now, this era of change, is heralding the coming of the Lord. This era, era of change, it has allowed social media to make it easier to spread the gospel. Hats off to you, those of you who use your phones. To spread the gospel. Those of you who use your phones. To spread the gospel. I want to draw our attention to something you know. I want to draw our attention to something. I think I have it in another slide. But hey. The Bible speaks about the coming of Christ. But you know one of the things the Bible says. Is that this gospel must be preached throughout the world. 
social media is enabling the gospel to preach throughout the world. Every nook and corner in the world now, people can use cell phones and they can get the gospel message. What are you doing? Are you part of fulfilling, fulfilling sorry, God's mandate in this era of change? What part are you playing in that? I want to challenge the young people among us. I want to challenge your youths. Come and get up. Get up. Begin to spread the gospel by the way you live and by speaking to persons one on one. That's the greatest weapon in terms of witnessing. It's not so much a mass crusade. And mind you, I have nothing against mass crusade. Anybody can hide behind the crowd in mass crusade. And let me tell you that. As a young Christian, I know what it is to face people and to challenge them with the gospel. Listen, there are some people, they're good at putting up a front in a crowd. And they will tell you everything about church the moment you begin to minister because they have friends around them. Take them one on one. Take them one on one. Is God's mandate still important today? Yes, it is important. And you would find I'm knocking our children because I understand how powerful children can be. Children, witness to your friends. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them that he died for them. The question can be asked. The mandate of God, how can you fulfill it? According to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, what did Paul say to Timothy? Paul said to Timothy, we are to preach the word. How can you fulfill the mandate of Christ? By preaching the word. He said, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know what you have to do, brethren? How can you fulfill the mandate? Simply by preaching the word of God. Come on, saints of God. Tell someone. Tell anyone. Tell everyone about Jesus. You don't need a magic wand. To spread the gospel. The message in this mess age. This is a mess age. And the gospel must be preached. I ask us this morning. Parents. I ask us this morning. What are your children learning at school and I am not talking about the subjects that they teach who is influencing them who is influencing your children hmm. this is a mess up age our children have to stand and they have to begin to say I am a Christian and that's who I am our children have to begin to live holy lives we have to teach them. But you know what? It starts from us. It starts with us. The mandate of God must be fulfilled. How? By preaching the word of God. According to Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. You might also ask a question. Why? Is there a cause? Is there a need for us to fulfill the mandate of God today? Why? <laughs> Let me say to us, we are in the last of the last days. The mandate must be fulfilled because we are in the last of the last days. Why must it be fulfilled? Because man will be judged. According to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. 
hear what Paul said to Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 1. He says what? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So why must we preach the gospel? Why must we fulfill the mandate? Because God is going to judge man. And we do not want the blood of man to be upon our shoulders. Why? The time will come. And I'm saying to us, no is when men will not endure sound doctrine. Why must we preach the gospel? Why must the mandate be fulfilled? Because man is lost and man needs Jesus Christ. Man is lost. Man is going to a devil's hell. And man needs Jesus. Where must that mandate be fulfilled? I want us to look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1. I know we have read that over and over. And I know that we are acquainted with it. But this morning, I want to draw something to our attention. As we look at where must the mandate of God be fulfilled. Chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Where must the mandate be fulfilled? Mm. Brother Bandy, thank you for the work you're doing on that radio station. Every night spreading that gospel. According to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, first of all, Ye shall be witnesses unto me where? Jerusalem. Where is your Jerusalem? Where is your Jerusalem? Your Jerusalem is your home. Your immediate and extended families. He did not stop there. He said Jerusalem and all Judea. And when you think of Judea, you're thinking of our communities. So your friends and your loved ones. Can I ask us this morning, how many persons in your community know that you're a Christian? How many persons in the community know that we are saved soul people? You know long ago they used to call us saved soul? And it was a tease word, you know. But I like it. I like it. It differentiates. The saved soul is differentiated from the church goer. They used to tease us, save soul. Says here, you shall be witnesses. I call us this morning to understand that God has given us a command. And we must fulfill his mandate in this era of change. So, all Judea speaks about our communities. Then he went on, he said what? Samaria. Mm? And we can liken Samaria as to our workplaces. So you talk about your colleagues and your associates. And then he said to the uttermost part of the earth. So you think of the wider world, your acquaintances and your non-acquaintances. What do you use your social media devices to do, may I ask? I'm not a social media person, per se. I use it because I have to use it. But there are a number of you sitting here, you love it. Oh, yes. And I mean, nothing wrong with that. You love it. If you love it, you love it. Nothing wrong with that. But my question to us this morning, how often do you use it to spread the gospel? There are some postings that would turn up your tripe inside you when you watch it. I challenge us this morning.
to use your social media platforms to spread the gospel. God expects us to spread the gospel. And the question to be asked is when? When should the mandate be fulfilled? Considering that we are in a mess of age, do we have the message? I say to us, the church has the message. We have the message. The church has the message. The world is longing for the message. When should that mandate be fulfilled? The time is now. According to chapter 4. The whole of chapter 4. Hmm? It says be instant in season, out of season according to verse 2. And according to verse 3 it says what? The time would come when they will not what? Endure song doctrine. But are you expected to preach it? Are you expected to preach it? Are you expected to fulfill it? I said to you earlier on, read Matthew chapter 4. The entire chapter. But pause for a while at verse 14. Verse 14 speaks about preaching the gospel to all nations. Hey. It's nice to come in church on Sundays, you know. Brethren, I said it's nice to come in church on Sundays, you know. It's nice to come in church and dance and have a good time. Some people say they get a sweat in church. Nothing wrong with that. Hey. But after you leave church, where is your Christian life lived? Christian life is not lived inside here. Those four walls. We live the Christian life on the outside. So our holiness has to be on the outside. Being filled with the Holy Ghost for the work comes on the outside. I make that statement all the time. And I say that there are lots of Christians. And when I, when I talk about the church and Christians, I'm not just talking about temple of deliverance. Eh? No, I'm speaking general. But I say to us, we have a lot of obese Christians. A lot of Christians suffer from spiritual obesity. Why? Because we hear and we hear and we hear and we put in and we put in. What do you do with what you put in? What do we do with what we put in? We put in. It's like people who eat and eat and eat. They become obese. Let's check ourselves this morning. Are we obese? Are we obese this morning? When last have you told somebody that Jesus died for them? Are we obese Christians this morning? Because if you continue to fill yourself with all that you get on Sunday morning and Monday night and Thursday night, and you don't do anything about it, you will become obese. Question to ask ourselves this morning. Am I an obese Christian? Do I share the gospel? Little children, I want to challenge you children. Because you can be effective. I got saved at age 15. And I knew what it was to be bold for the Lord. I got saved at age 15. And I did not hesitate as a child of God. Everybody in my class knew I was a Christian. Yeah? Everybody in my class knew I was a Christian. I got saved in Form 4. And the rest of my secondary school life, all my friends knew I was a Christian. How many of your friends in school know that you're a Christian? How many of your friends in school know that you have given your life to Jesus? Come on, boys and girls. This Christian thing is for everybody. 
It is not just adults. I'll tell you that when the devil lashes at us, he does not just lash adults. He lashes children. A few years, that was before COVID. I remember watching a little girl here and my heart broke. I cried. We prayed for that child after service. The child was about two years. The child was having some problems. And when I watched that little child, about two years, started manifesting, my heart broke. You really think, children, that it's only adults the devil lashes? No. He lashes everybody. And listen, there isn't anything called children attacking her. No. There isn't anything called children attack. And so I challenge you this morning that we align ourselves with what God requires of us. Holy living. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to fulfill the mandate of Christ. If you're going to fulfill the mandate of Jesus in this era of change, this is a pandemic world, you know. Not just because COVID came. This is a chaotic world that we are living in. This world needs Jesus. I think it was Colin David who sang that song. That this world needs Jesus. I say to you adults, your friends need Jesus. I say to you boys and girls, your friends, they need Jesus. This world is going to a devil's eternity. Does it bother you? When your friend dies and your friend did not know Jesus, where are you this morning? Where are we this morning? Those of you on the outside, where are we this morning? As we seek to fulfill God's mandate in this era of change. Where are you? Where are we this morning? Are we in the place that God wants us to be? I want to submit to us. Holy living is not plain a thing. Mm -mm. It's not plain. You know, sometimes when you speak about holiness, people say to you, are you holier than thou? <laughs> are you holier than thou? No. God requires that of us. What is God saying to us? God is saying some things to us this morning. One, we must recognize that this is an era of change that we are living in. We must recognize that. Look at what is happening now. People could stay home and work effectively. You don't have to go on the site. And we all know too well, children were home learning. You know, question mark, how many of them really learned? <laughs> I never knew that there was something called Zoom in my life. Never. Never. But look at how we can connect to one another era of change 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 is sweeping through this world but i'll tell you that the governments of the world they don't have the answer you know no the governments of the world they don't have the answer i mean they're trying their best i feel sorry for them i'm glad i'm not a politician honestly what 
I'm glad I'm not a politician. Uh uh. And that's why we have to pray for them. God expects us in this age that we are living in that we must sh be sure about his mandate. What is God's mandate to you? What is he asking you to do? Brethren, this morning, what is he asking you to do as an individual? What is he asking me to do? How many of your loved ones know that you're a Christian? You know that there are some Christians who live in a home and their, their, their relatives don't know that they are Christians? They only see them coming to church. What is God saying to us? That we must fulfill that mandate. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We must walk in holiness. We must operate in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Gone were the days when we think it's far-fetched. And I mean, some apologies need to be given to our children. Because you know what? Long ago, <laughs> the anointing of the Holy Ghost was displayed in a very negative manner. Throwing down chairs and kicking down benches and all of these things. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. You know? And because of that, a lot of people became fearful. They did not want to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. I'm saying to us, baptism of the Holy Ghost has nothing to do with throwing down chairs. Not only that, you know. <laughs> Women, I was told, used to use that Sister John as a means of Sister John and I not speaking. And so, I um, feel so much get by Sister John and I bounce her down and I step on her toes. All of this stupidness used to happen in church, you know. All of this nonsense used to happen in church. Yeah. So Sister Y and I, we ain't going on good. And what I'm under the anointing so much that I'm dancing over there and I make sure I step on her toe and I stamp the toe. Really? Really? Holy Spirit has nothing to do with that. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us. Is to empower us for ministry. To empower us for service. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not for confusion. <laughs> Not for confusion. So I don't go on a chong the table deliberately so that it falls on Sister Lewis's foot. No. And I'm under the anointing so badly. Hey. Spirit of the prophet is subjected to the prophet. I don't care how Holy Ghost filled we are. We are in control of our lives. So I'm not speaking about that era. I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about understanding the importance of the Holy Spirit to guide you, to empower you, to give you boldness, to stand before kings, to stand before the crowd. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Do you need the Holy Spirit? What is God saying to us? We must walk in holiness. We must operate in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hey. I do not want to operate outside of the Spirit of God. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. I've shared that testimony already. But that testimony would forever live with me. Hey, brethren. When you are cornered in difficult situation, you need the Holy Spirit to help you. When you are cornered, when you look up 
and you look down and there is nobody to help you you need the holy spirit to guide you you need him to guide you bible says he would guide us the holy spirit hovers over us he protects us he is our shield that protects us A number of you would have heard me spoken about that. I left a prayer and fast one night. We had all night prayer meeting a Friday night. And of course, as an obedient child, I've always been obedient to my mama. As an obedient child, Saturday morning, my mother goes to the market every Saturday. And before board wife wakes, she's out. And I remember saying to my mother, I'm going to all night. And her words were, Lynette, make sure you ought to come back to help me joke the load. And so I decided at a wrong one ish, I was going to leave to go up home. Not here. I was living in Mount Craven at that time. And I remember at that time, we didn't have much of the young men in church because a number of them had gone off to Bible school. And when I was about to leave, I remember some of these sisters said to me, Sister King, I'm not King, Rennie. Um, Sister Rennie, you alone going up that hour? And I said, yes, I have to go. I have to go joke the load for Nenen. And they kept saying to me, no, don't go. And I remember I left walking through Satay to so go up to Mount Craven, way behind God back. And as I walked the street, come down to low tongue etc when i got close to maho bridge i saw a light spotting me like a mad person way down by the bay spotting me and the light spotting me and i kept walking but something said to me no somebody's following you and i stood there at that time in my early 20s, being an athlete, I felt I could have run, outrun the person. And so I stood there contemplating what to do. Something said to me, run. Whoever it is can't catch up with you because I saw the person way down by the bay. And something said to me, uh-uh, don't run. And so I stood up and I walked back a few steps right in front of a house which was pastor's godmother her daughter house so they knew me and i attempted to go bang on the door and say somebody's following me but i'm like these people are sleeping i mid morning what's wrong with you and i remember i just felt a peace because there is this lamp pole right in front of the house there and I believe it was the Holy Spirit that spoke to me. Lean on the lamp pole. So I went on the lamp pole and I leaned like that right in front of the street. Don't make joke with God's Holy Spirit and his children. I leaned on that lamp pole there and this gentleman passed in front of me, right in front of me, searching for me. I don't know what God did. I don't know if God blinded his eyes. I don't know what God did. And I stood up and I looked at him. I did not know him very well. He went over the bridge and he searched. He searched. And that's when I was convinced he was searching for me. Because this is the same gentleman. A few years ago, during sports, Magdalene called it sports would have ambushed a woman right around there to rape her. And he shined, he shined, and he's shining. And I'm standing right in front of the post. The lamp pole is shining over me. But you know what? Because I've learned to depend on the Spirit of God. He protected me. He did not see me and he kept walking. I stood there for a while and I felt impressed to go back to the church. I went back to the church and I met the folks. 
But I stood up most of the time on the step where we used to call Japal step there. And around three, four o'clock in the morning, well, about four rather, I saw the gentleman coming back up. And I remember saying to one of the sisters, this is a man who followed me. And that's when she told me he was who he was. You know what? Because I've learned to depend upon God. You think that's, that's experience? That's just one. When I praise God here, I know what I'm praising God for. That's just one. I remember going, so celebrating WM week. And we were going to visit Shanti Mel from Satish Church. And I decided I am already late. I don't know if the sisters are in front. I don't know if they're behind. So I better go. And we were going to pass in that lonely road from Mount Craven to go to Shanty Mail. Bush alone. And I remember as I was walking alone. When I got to a place. I heard a man shouted way on the other side on a hill. There was a ravine that separated that hill from that hill where I was. And he shouted, hey, woman. And I'm like, okay. So I stood up. And I looked and I saw this gentleman running down with full speed. So I froze. What do I do? You know what? There is something called spiritual cable. A telegram. Spiritual telegram. I knew what it was to send a spiritual telegram to heaven. Right there and then. And I stood up there. And I braced myself. God, this is your daughter. Look at this gentleman running down because he sees a woman. He's running down. He got down to the ravine. And he was coming up full speed. And I'm like. Holy Ghost, you have to fight for me today. I don't know what you're going to do, God, but you're going to fight for me today. And as he rose up on the hill, I heard a talk behind me. When I looked just bare in the corner, I saw Sister Williams and Sister Nelson and Sister Alexander. As he rose up to attack me, he saw the women coming. You know what he did? Like a beaten dog with his tail between his legs, he just ran and down. And I can give you stories and stories because I've learned to depend upon God. I'm saying to us this morning, brethren, don't leave your Christian life there. Don't leave your Christian life on the surface. Leave holy lives. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Allow him to cover you. My stories, they go on and on and on and on. What is God saying to us? All of you here knew that I lost my mom. When my mom was sick with cancer, I literally pushed myself inside my mother. I walked to, or I drove to the hospital for six long weeks, every day, from Sunday to Sunday. I understood what my mom was going through. When she died, I was broken. And I'll tell you that nothing is wrong in grieving, but be careful how you grieve. I grieved for my mom so badly. Let me tell you some experiences I had. And I'm not giving you Nancy's story. I'm giving you reality. I felt every pain that my mother Felt. Everything that she went through, 
the pains came in my breast. I did mammogram twice or three times. And they said, we're not seeing anything there. Nothing is wrong. All the pains that she had in her fingers and her feet, I had them. It was as though the spirit of death transferred from my mother to me. And I would be sung to sleep. And that's no Nancy story. I would be sung to sleep on the bed. And I would be awoken by the spirit of death. And it would literally say to me, I am death. I am here. That's no Nancy story I'm telling you. There were times I moved from the bed and went down to the floor to sleep because I had pains all over me as I was carrying my mother's cancer. I remember saying to Desiree and to Pastor, I am not feeling well. I remember saying that to them. I remember I took Pastor down to Savant Swayze. And I said, I want to speak to you. I'm not doing well. Look what is happening to me. And I remember him saying to me, I am aware. I am fasting. He did not tell me that he observed it. He said, yes, I'm aware. I have begun fasting about it. And more than one night, I would be awakened. I am death. I am here. But you know what? The Bible says that people that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. You never heard me talk about that. I went through this ordeal. But you know, one thing in the back of my mind, the God I serve is able to see me through. I knew what it was to depend on the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you that. When you begin to live holy lives, he comes true for you. He comes true for you. When you depend on the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, he defends you. Brethren, don't mind me when you see a dancing in front of you. I know why I'm dancing. I'm not dancing just because I feel like dancing. I'm dancing because the experiences I had with God, I am thankful to him. So I challenge you this morning. I challenge you today. Live holy lives. I challenge you today. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. I challenge you. Don't live weak Christian lives. Would you, will you face those testings? Oh yes. Your own might be different from mine. It might be worse. I don't know. What is it that you're going through? Where are you in your Christian life? What is it that you're going through? Is he able to come true for you? Is the Holy Spirit able to defend you? I could take the whole day to testify. <laughs> I could take the whole day to testify. But you know what? God is saying to us this morning, we must evaluate ourselves and see where we are in Christ. Not only are we called to evaluate ourselves, we must educate ourselves in and for this era of change are you satisfied where you are or do you want more do you want more of god do you want more of his holy spirit have you reached your pinnacle already that you have enough that you don't need any more no we need more we need more so you must educate yourself in this era and for this era of change. Where are you? Last of all, we must evangelize this dying world. We must evangelize 
this dying world and I go back to one of the this slide here I want to draw your attention to this personal witnessing yes mass evangelism and so forth they are okay personal evangelism it is time that we begin to see ourselves as one of the persons whom God gave the mandate, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What are you doing? What are you doing? We must evangelize this dying world. This world is dying. This world is chaotic. This world needs Jesus. And so in our daily lives, at our workplaces, at school, wherever we are, we must begin to evangelize this world. Remember, this is 2023, the year of the three R's. And can you say it together with me? Sorry, the three, why did I put R? That's an error. The year of the three E's. Evaluation, what's the other one? Education and? I call upon us, church, this morning. Examine yourself. I call upon you this morning. Examine yourself. Where are you today? Where are you? How long have you been saved? How long you gave your life to Jesus? How long you said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, save my soul? How long have you been baptized? How long have you been going to church? Where are you today? Are you still in the same spot? Are you still in the same area when you first gave your life to Jesus? Or have you grown? Have you grown? Do you recognize that you must live holy? Are you in the place where you say to yourself today, hey, holiness must be my motto. It must be my anthem. And I'm going to live holy. It is not something, as I said, you put on and you take out. It is part of the Christian life. Holiness unto the Lord. I call upon us today that we live holy lives. I call upon us today that we live consecrated lives. I call upon us today that we live the life that is pleasing to God. Oh God, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us. Help us. Oh God, I invite you to stand with me. Oh God, we are your children. We are your children. God, somewhere along the line, we have been stagnant. Lord, there are those who have not been able to rise.